Hey everyone, in this video I'll be going over my analysis for the units from the new semester banners as well as the skill evolutions that were released around the same time. I know that this video is a bit late with both banners being closed, but that is sort of the consequence when LifeWonders decides to partition their release. So with that said, let's just pretend that this analysis is still relevant and get started. <laughs> So, for the first unit in the Part 1 a New Semester 2020 banner, we have Kasuga, a unit that does not require to be moved, yet still plays selfishly. On joining battle, he self-bestows 1-2 to two refreshal damage and defense buffs, depending on its rarity. A buff is stripped for each time he struck, but these can be refreshed when he receives buffs. He also gains HP and CP on buff. Altogether, this props Kasuga up as a unit who plays best with a constant buff supply. He also gains one extra buff when debuffed, either Rage or Rage Plus, depending on his rarity. For his 5, this means that he would have 3 native damage buffs that enables greater than 20,000 damage per square on full build. Additional niche features include being a reliable burner and inflicting decent flat damage to both allies and enemies when leaving battle. The burn is mostly useful for his advantage against that status on charge. To capitalize on his buff refreshment gameplay, consider bringing units that can constantly supply short-lived one-turn buffs. These buffs include Limit, Crit, Evasion, Tenacity, Protection, and Arousal. He can maintain his native buffs while sustaining self-heal and CP increase with units like Furufumi or Beachside Kotaro. Bringing Shenon can facilitate Kazuka's buff refreshment gameplay with Evasion and Poison Reversal, while also triggering Rage or Rage Plus with Poison. His 5 can gain a massive amount of CP on join, making turn 1 charges possible. To achieve this, you equip ARs and bring him with units that can bestow more buffs and flat CP on phase start or on join. The next feature 5 on the part 1 banner is Horus, the World Thrust unit. Although Horus has two damage amplifying measures, Limit and Stigma, these features are not what make him special. Rather, it is non-damage attenuating defensive capabilities where he shines over other units. He is able to apply Guts at an extremely reliable rate of 90% to himself and nearby units every two turns and is able to remove the debuffs of units left and right of him every time he is buffed. For his 5, he has 5 different self-bestowed buffs that can trigger debuff removal, positioning himself as one of the most potent cleansers. His nullify buff immunity ensures he can trigger his debuff removal unabated for the most. However, as much of these buffs are dependent on moving, his functionality is strongly crippled by movement disabling debuffs. Bring him to quests right for debuffs that do not disable movement, and for quests that inflict lethal damage. He would pair well with any unit that can benefit from limit and that can manage the off turns he cannot provide guts. His near constant guts is extremely exploitable with the right positioning and game sense, such as by swapping him and his allies between the front and back to continuously safely exhaust guts while simultaneously refreshing it. The first 4 star in the part 1 banner to be discussed is Lian and Shi, the water nun range unit. Lian and Shi joins the ranks of being a powerful nun range unit, being the first named unit to have permanent extended movement in all directions, and also have the ability to bestow 3 damage buffs at an extremely reliable rate. While Shi herself cannot deal much damage even on charge, she will support the unit in front of her with both damage buffs and charge to make them a beast. She will also drain her front ally's HP, strengthening the effect of the limit she applies. The risk of losing her frontliner is mitigated by the guts she applies every 4 turns from her self-building charge. She is utterly shut down by any skill ceiling or movement disabling statuses, but she makes her nullify debuff on move a saving grace. She also has no damage attenuating measures for either herself or her front ally, making lethal enemies who either survived from or entirely avoided her front ally's attack a looming threat to consider. Her front ally should be someone who can ensure widespread lethal damage with her buffs reliably to prevent retaliation. She would also do well with allies that can supply the damage attenuation she lacks. Lastly, she would complement units who do not need to move or who cannot move at all. The second four and the last unit to be discussed in the part one banner is Tanatomo, the Valiant Hakenshi. Tanatomo's most general purpose role is to provide vigor to frontline allies while centering the aggroed enemy and punishing them with charm. Vigor is paired with tenacity and charm with bind in his 4. He can also provide minor healing and potentially revive frontliners when struck. This makes him a fairly decent support to keep in the back. 
His last skill, Assassin, gives him a secondary but unique function of finishing off units with the death aversion buffs Evasion and Guts, being able to deal bonus damage to both while also potentially stripping those buffs. Tanatomo does not use this function particularly well, as his own intrinsic damage is lacking, and he would find more use for finishing low rather than full HP enemies carrying these buffs. Tanatomo can inflict countdown on leave as well as on charge, as well as a sizable flat HP depletion on charge for his 4, which can provide decent additional damage for enemies with defense buffs or other resistances. Next, I'll be summarizing my analysis for the Part 2 banner units, starting off with the 5 star Infernal Non Range unit, Daikoku. Daikoku has a similar role to Regular Snow, providing the classic triple support of healing, increasing CP, and providing protection to allies. He is more vulnerable than Snow is, however, due to self restoring only one non guaranteed defense buff to self, being Infernal, and not having any self heal. He is also restricted to supporting only the units directly in slash range of him. The key to his utility, however, is that he can provide the classic triple support without any need to move. If he is moved, however, his range becomes snipe, and can inflict struck enemies with debuffs that apply to horizontal collaterals as well. In addition to curse, he sabotages the skill efficacy of the enemy, inflicting the obstruct in his 3 and skill lock and draining his 5. In addition to this, he also suppresses the border's oppression every couple of turns. This is coupled with buff steal on his 5. However, neither activate at an impressive rate. Daikoku acts as a support unit, and would best complement frontline damage dealers dependent on moving. He may also benefit from units that can provide the sustaining support he does not supply for himself at the same time. Shenong, regular Oniwaka, all three cards of Horkei Okami, and Time Slip Snow are examples that fit both criteria. The second five of the banner is Bale, the Infernal Magic user. Bale strongly punishes singular buffs on the enemy team, inflicting the new conditional debuff, Buff Reversal. This debuff increases damage taken by 2.5 times and reduces the damage given by 0.25 times, and thus is able to effectively cancel, if not reverse, the efficacy of most damage buffs, as well as cancel most defense buffs. This effectiveness of Buff Reversal, however, does not scale with buff stacking, and only negligibly impacts the damage done to units with evasion. However, while the player team may not be able to exploit enemy buff stacking, the damage of Bale himself does scale, having advantage against every buff. He is still unlikely to overcome the damage reduction from evasion though. Outside of punishing buffs, Bale amplifies damage for his team that he cannot individually exploit. He inflicts weakness after attacking, and bestows attack up to allies but not to self unmove. His 5 is able to rescale damage further, by attenuating damage his team receives with curse and defense up. Thus, in situations where enemy buffs are not present, Bale exclusively acts as a support unit. Overall, enemy buffs, especially on appearance, have been rare outside of certain challenge quests, so Bale's utility would be normally limited to such quests. However, bringing a unit that can bestow buffs to enemy, such as Leecho with his weapon change to blow bestow, can open up his general utility. 4 in the banner to be discussed is Balor, the Valiant Blow range unit. Being the first unit with non range charge, Balor's playstyle would naturally focus around this oddity. He is a unit that slowly but surely builds a CP, but can only use his charge by self restoring himself charge weapon change to all, and is self restored peculiarly when receiving other buffs at a very unreliable rate of 10%. However, he can roll for a chance to activate it several times if he is given several buffs in a turn. The payoff for playing along these unique conditions is a very powerful charge. Strengthened by countdown advantage coupled with countdown, his 3 inflicts 17,000 damage per square at magic range, while his 4 inflicts a massive 24,000 damage per square at all range. And in both cases, another 10k is dealt from countdown on charge at the end of the turn. On turns where his charge isn't ready, he acts as a damage rescaler, both amplifying outgoing team damage and attenuating incoming team damage by inflicting both stigma and paralyze at shot range on miss. His 4 can also inflict countdown at a somewhat unreliable rate, through the same condition and range. Despite being a unit that requires time to build his charge, he is not naturally suited for very lengthy games due to his self-inflicted HP reduction every turn. Pair him up with units that can heal, bestow CP, and boost his charge's strength. Units such as Beachside Chernbug or Time Step Gima to provide all three. As one of the most reliable countdown inflectors, he may also pair well with regular Shino 5, who has a 4 times countdown advantage with his recent skill specific evolution. The second 4 in the banner to be discussed is Neja, the blow range unit. 
Nature has the unique combination of having extended horizontal movement coupled with being able to self-bestow movement expansion in all directions. This is locked behind their charge, which they can build over the course of usually 3 turns if they are continuously moved every turn. They can stack 3 instances of acceleration, guaranteed to acquire 1 stack for each move. They also gain Ardor and flat CPO move, which, when successfully activated and coupled with acceleration, nets at least 43 CP per turn. Thus, they can have extended mobility for 2 of every 3 turns, with the 3rd turn being their charge turn. On turns outside of their charge, units they hit can be pushed rightwards while pushing themselves leftward. Their 4 doles out decent but not remarkable damage under charge. Consider pairing them with someone who can amplify this charge damage. Avoid CP batteries as this may actually mess up the timing of letting movement expansion exhaust first to enable refreshment of it on charge. Neja would be best suited for wide or large maps where repositioning is a primary strategy. The last unit to be discussed in this banner is Tita. Tita experiences extreme damage reduction for any subsequent unit he hits after the first. On the other hand, he can deal respectable damage to the first unit due to his several damage buffs. He is designed to be a clint to a low range unit, only being able to damage one unit with a sizable 10k damage on his 3 and 16k on his 4. However, his reach for the first unit is more generous, reaching them within shot range for his 3 and snipe range for his 4. Thus, his attack can be compared to something like a rocket punch. His preferred positioning is a frontliner of an inverted team formation due to his various interactions with allies within inverted slash range. He is able to provide minor support with some healing and CP while copying all buffs. He is also able to bestow order to adjacent or nearby allies after attacking for a 3 and 4 respectively. Lastly, Tita has the potential for board wiping due to his all range charge which is not affected by the post hit damage penalty coupled with the rest of his kit. This role, however, also requires stringent conditions to set up. Firstly, phase start charges are deterred by intrinsic CP reduction at the same turn. Secondly, complementary combinations of self damage buffers would be brought to maximize Tita's own damage when he copies them on phase start. Tita would be unable to use some com powerful phase start buffs, such as crit, for his charge unless the remaining CP can be covered. Bringing a unit slotted after him that can bestow CP on phase start, such as Christmas Ryota with his new skill evolution, can overcome this deterrent and allow Tita to acquire damage buffs including crit to wipe the enemy board before they can even retaliate. And that covers both transient summons from the new semester campaign. Next I'll be covering the skill evolutions that were released concurrently. The skill evolutions were released with the 11th volume of the regular set, as well as the second volume of the skill specific set. The first evolution to be discussed in volume 11 of the regular evolutions is Cajoler. Cajoler Plus is a skill that all cards of Hakuman carry. Hakuman joins the growing list of reliable potent charmers, now having both a greater rate on her charm on attack and a new effect inflicting charm at 70% at face start in slash and thrust range. As a result, her Charmer role is comparable to that of Mystic Christmas Eager. This, coupled with her boosted 80% CP decrease and her usual binding kit, makes her a strong charge denier. Next, we have Miracle Child Plus, carried only by new champion of Christmas, Ryota 5. This evolution deepens Ryota's role as a CP battery, providing a guaranteed whopping 50 CP on appearance to allies within slash range, and near guaranteed 50 CP to the square in front in subsequent phase starts. It also provides a smaller improvement to the regeneration when struck skill effect, now bestowing to self as well. This new evo introduces Ryota to the ever burgeoning category of one phase, one turn, all range charge strategies. For example, Kotaro and potentially Kusuga gain a massive amount of CP on appearance, and Ryota can now cover the remaining CP to enable a powerful turn one charge. With additional damage buffs as necessary, this can clear phase one's boards. And with additional setup from other allies and AR cards that bestow CP on phase start, phase 2 can feasibly be ready for another board wipe with help from another 50 CP from Ryota. The last skill evolution of volume 11 is Devourer of the Strong, which is held only by Valentine Jail Leaked 4. Leaked originally had a minor role in weakening enemies that struck him, but this role has been expanded with the present evolution to enable him to punish enemies in turns after phase start. He can now inflict weakness at a 90% rate, while also inflicting the new debuff buff reversal also at 90% after attacking. Unfortunately, the fact that it is inflicted only after attack ensures Leaked can't benefit from the amplified damage it confers on the same turn he inflicts it. 
For turn 2 of any given phase, Leek can now fairly reliably have 4 damage amplifying statuses up, Vigor and Concentration and Stealth, and Weakness and Buff Reversal on the enemy, dealing a total of 65k damage. Enemy buffs would need to be present to activate Buff Reversal Smoke Flyer, however, so Leek can pair well with allies that bestow buffs to enemies, such as Leecha. Last, I'll be covering Volume 2 of Skill-Specific Evolutions, starting off with regular Zabania 5's Skill-Specific Evolution for Judgment Dealer, which can be translated as Praying Executioner. Raising the activation rate of Stigma Infliction to 90%, and changing its trigger time to immediately before attacking, ensures Zabania has a near-permanent damage boost, joining the ranks of other damage-dealing 5-star cards. Prayer on appearance ensures Stigma is guaranteed for the first 5 turns, and also raises the chance for his attack up to self. Lastly, two new effects that increase CP when debuffed and when struck at 90% speeds up his ability to gain his burn inflicting charge. Zabani has advantage against units with Stigma and burn, so this skill evolution lets him enjoy these advantages more frequently. Note that he has no intrinsic way to mitigate damage. Pairing him up with a unit that can supply healing and damage attenuation will enable him to more safely exploit his CP increasing skill effects. Next up, we have new champion Taurus Mask 4 with his skill, the Hot-Blooded, receiving a skill-specific evolution that can be translated as Fervent Bullfight. Taurus can now also supply allies as a damage amplifier and CP battery with a skill effect that was previously restricted just to himself. On move, he can now bestow Ardor, Spirit, and CP to adjacent allies along with Blessing and Glint. With 4 buffs on demand, he can complement allies with skill effects that trigger on buff, such as Beachside Chernabog 5 or Kathuga. Lastly, we have regular Oniwako 5's skill, Mountain Dweller, which received a skill-specific evolution that can be translated as Dweller of Mount Meru. Oniwako gains two entirely new roles as a buff pooler and thief. On move, he can copy all buffs from adjacent allies, as well as steal a buff from enemies in stress range. Like Tuscatli Poka, Oniwako can now steal buffs on move rather than on attack, at an atypically high rate of 80%. Additionally, his existing role to bestow ovation to his backliner has previously been difficult to maintain due to his Berserk or Berserk plus to self, amplifying incoming damage. However, he now gains tenacity on move, improving his own survivability to perform his original role. Unlike Christmas Eager, Oniwaka is not immune to weapon change, and so can acquire all range weapon change from Echo or Elp. However, he is also restricted to copying all buffs only with his backliner, limiting his buff stacking potential. Pair him up with any units with self-bestowed buffs, particularly defensive ones, to make Oniwaka survive even longer with his backliner. And that concludes the analysis portion of this video. And now for my final thoughts. I think that the part 1 banner was a lot more worth pulling for, uh, especially was just singularly just Lian and Shi, probably the best unit in both banners, in my own personal usage, but that's just biased based on my own sort of preference for board wiping strategies and buff stacking strategies. Part 2 also has a lot of nifty gimmicks uh, that I believe other people would like, such as Balor's very potent charge, which is quite unique in that it really doesn't need any buffs to be able to clear the board, but it really does feel like Part 2 was more of a banner that just introduced uh, nifty little interesting things to test out what may be coming up in the future. That is to say, it's uh, testing grounds for new paradigms. Part 1 seemed to be just the Lian and Qi banner, to be honest. <laughs> My thoughts on the skills evolutions, both the skill specific ones and the regular ones, were generally quite fantastic. Maybe not all of them were fantastic, but the fact that there was just like about half of them were pretty amazing, such as uh, Oniwaka's and uh, a Miracle Child, and maybe Zabania's, and it's probably just Oniwaka's as well as uh, Miracle Child. But yeah, both of those were quite fantastic. I wouldn't have expected that from skill evolutions, but that definitely sets the standard of how good skill evolutions can be. And it completely transforms those units as uh, units that were stuck from older generations to potentially must pick units now, in certain cases. Uh, I guess, even though I don't have either Oniwaka or Ryota, I'm more excited for the fact that it's just setting the standard and now I can look even more forward to skill evolutions, as if I wasn't looking forward to them enough. And with that, that concludes my thoughts on this entire campaign. 
Uh, it is late, like I said, but thankfully uh, these units are all permanent and the skull evolutions, of course, are also permanent. I may be busy during the Desert Journey campaign and anything past that for the next few months, however, so I'm not sure if I can prepare an analysis for that, but if I do, it will definitely be <laughs> during the actual event. So this just happened to be a peculiar situation that I was only able to release them quite late just because of the staggered release of everything. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the Desert Journey event, and I'll see you guys later. Good luck!